Okay, thanks a lot. It's a great honor to be here to honor you. Um, I would like to, it resonated very much what the President Mario Draghi said about your abilities, your, your interest, your curiosity in uh, macro finance, in particular in financial stability and uh, our discussions we had over the years, I value them very much. In particular, I remember when we once walked on the banks of the River Rhine and we talked about various things, in particular one particular issue, and it also showed your open-mindedness and your curiosity and the intellectual exchange I really value this and I hope we can stay in touch afterwards. What I want to talk today, I want to talk about, about financial frictions in macro models. I think that's one of the themes uh, Constancia was um, pushing very much so within the ECB, and the ECB actually was doing a lot of progress in these dimensions. But I would like to go a little beyond that, also go into tokens and blockchains and inside money creation, because once you think of financial frictions, money has a particular role, and then actually new forms of money might interplay with that. And so the talk will be in two parts. One is on the macro models, and the second part will be on the models of money in the digital age. And I will also touch upon some uh, currency competition, um, which some things I'm recently interested in. But the first part is on macro models. And essentially, I would like to say one aspect which came up before is a shift away from impulse response functions, much more to a risk dynamics or resilience view of the macro economy. So but additionally, what we did in macroeconomics, essentially we have a one-time shock, and the one-time shock hits uh, the economy, like say here, and then you know it propagates over time, so it will last, even though it's a one-time shock, it will last long, and it might be amplified because it feeds back, so it might be amplified uh, much more today as well. So there's a persistent element to it, and there's an amplification. The famous models, Benanke, Gertler, Gellichris, Kiyotaki, Moore, and so forth, who have pushed this line. But importantly, that the return to the steady state is actually deterministic. So once you have a shock, you for sure, everybody in the economy knows that you walk back. There's no uncertainty how long the recession will last and how risky it will be subsequently. And that's essentially what was, is a, was the predominant view before the crisis. And with financial frictions, risk matters a lot because essentially finance is mostly about risk. And the question is how to capture more risky, more rich environment which captures the resiliency of the system and whether we drop off to our lower growth path or whether you know, we return back to the existing growth path. So what the macro literature has done since the crisis is very much focus on non-linearities, saying oh, there's not a linear effect, so it can be very different once you move further away from the steady state, so things amplify much more dramatically. And this, if you put it in a model, even though the shock itself has no fat tail, so it's, uh, let's say, a normally distributed shock, then the outcome in the economy has fat tails, because the non-linearities translate a normal shock into a shock with fat tails. And you get skewness, so downside shocks act very differently from upside shocks. And with financial frictions, that's very natural because a downside shock comes with capital constraints and other liquidity constraints, which amplifies in downside, but not, might not amplify so much in the upside. So you get skewness in the macro dynamics. And what I would like to stress is this endogenous volatility dynamics. So the volatility might change dramatically and is time varying. So it's not always the same. Suddenly volatility, we go in a much more volatile environment and things move around. So what I've plotted here is just, if you have a state variable, you have a, a drift, which is given by this. So the state variable is, is essentially at the steady state at this point because the drift is zero. So it doesn't, here the drift is negative, so it drifts the system, drifts back and here the uh, drift is positive, it drifts to this, and you end up in this stochastic steady state. But it's never the case that you're in this steady state because the system is constantly shocked, and the volatility itself is also much higher. So in this range, the volatility is just given by the fundamental volatility, but in that range, below the steady state, you have the total volatility because it's the fundamental volatility plus some amplification, some endogenous volatility, which makes the total volatility much higher. 
So new macro will reflect all this stochastic volatility environments and make gives us a much richer environment. And what, what does it mean to have this stochastic volatility? The precautionary motive plays a very important role because if the world becomes more uncertain, people shift into different assets, they behave differently, they save more, and everything feeds back and makes the whole world then again more stochastic. Okay, that's essentially what this does. And two paradox we essentially I would like to emphasize and stress here is the volatility paradox. The volatility paradox says if the current volatility is very low, if you measured volatility is very low, then risk is building up in the background. And be aware that's actually when the times are most risky. So that's essentially low measures of volatility is actually a danger rather than a sign of a great moderation. And the second one is this paradox of prudence, and I will come back to this. Essentially, what's microprudent is not necessarily macroprudent. It, it's most likely macroimprudent. Okay, that's essentially very close to Keynesian's paradox of thrift, just applied to the risk space rather than the consumption savings space. So that's essentially uh, what I wanted to stress. And the second component, which essentially comes more from the finance literature, which entered a macro, if you focus on traditional macro, if you saw how the asset prices, how they're affected, how long-term bond prices are affected, they're mostly affected by changes in cash flows. You know, if you change the interest rate, there will be less interest rates down the road. But the reason literature is, is actually shown that actually the stochastic discount factor matters much more. And the stochastic discount factor reflects risk premium. So essentially risk premium matter much more the news about the confidence and risk premium matter much more than the cash flow news itself. And that's empirically well documented in the failure of the expectations hypothesis. The expectations hypothesis is essentially saying that future risk, uh, future uh, interest rate matter for you know understanding long-term bond prices, but empirically what matters is much more the change in the risk premium. The same is true for the uncovered interest rate parity and other puzzles empirically puzzles, which all point to a time-varying risk premium as a key driver in the macroeconomy. Of course, it makes the whole modeling way more challenging because we have to go away from a stock and a flow analysis much more to a risk and a risk premium analysis. And that's a much more difficult animal to handle, especially if it's moving around, if it's time-varying. So that's essentially the shift in macro models away from stock flow to more risk perspective and a resilience perspective. Then I would like to go, once you go to this risk perspective, you say, oh, the markets are imperfect, the financial markets are imperfect, and then the natural role for money emerges, okay, because uh, you would like to hold some money because there's a risky world out there and hopefully money is less risky and people rush into money. Okay, so there's the traditional models, Alice Samuels and the old G model, which is the traditional way to justify money. But there's also money as a store of value, as a safe asset, where in the Bewley model, you know, money essentially is the way to save in a safe form. And you have some idiosyncratic endowment shocks. You have some labor income. Suddenly, the unemployment uncertainty is much going up. Then you would like to save more, and then demand for money is going up. I've worked with Yuli Sanikov on a different type of model. There's also idiosyncratic risk, but idiosyncratic risk comes with investment. So physical capital investments have become much more risky in recessions. And then you would like to shift your portfolio more into risk, le less risky money rather than investing in capital. So everybody shifts away from physical capital investments towards much less risky money investments. And then there's, of course, the money as a medium of exchange, and money has uh, lower transaction costs. And that's essentially models of, of outside money where there's no big role for the financial sector. And of course, then what you want to do is you want to create a financial sector which should be core of any macro model, which creates this money inside money, not only the outside money, but also inside money. And banks play a particular role, not only a monitoring role, but also diversifying away some of this idiosyncratic risk you have in, in, in various models. And they can absorb and diversify away idiosyncratic risk. And if the banks are undercapitalized, they cannot do this job anymore. And they push idiosyncratic risk back to the households. And that leads to even more money demand. Or banks, they create some inside money. And the inside money, and I will come back to this, might be even better now than outside money as a medium of exchange. Okay? And we will come back in future types of money. It might be that you know there might be new forms of money where the banks or IT firms play a more important role. So let me just say to this second idea essentially that 
if you look back in history, we had different forms of money. There's the Zayap stone, which was you know, the unit of account. It's in fixed supply. It's hard to forge. And you can see one of uh, these uh, outside monies. It's a good unit of account, but it's not a good medium of exchange. You can try it and lift it and see whether you can pass it on to somebody else. So typically what you would like to have here is essentially pass on this medium of exchange um, to, to somebody else. And if you can't pass it on, what, what <coughs> you derive claims from this uh, thing. So somebody comes along, I give you a, a token or a piece of paper, which gives you a claim on this type of stone. And then this piece of paper is traveling around when you make payments. And that's essentially creating inside money. And I will come back. New forms of money in form of tokens, electronic tokens, will do the same thing. Um, gold is the same thing. What's interesting is typically new forms of money like Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are criticized for being a bad store of value and for being bad mediums of exchange because it can't handle the transaction volume what Visa card and other electronic forms of money, inside money, do. But the same could have been said to gold. You know, in the olden days, whenever there was a new discovery of a new gold source, suddenly the value of gold changed dramatically, or whenever a new ship came from the new world to the old world, and suddenly the gold supply tripled. So you could have said the volatility was very high. So you could have criticized gold as a good source of outside money as well. And there's this famous paper by Tom Sargent and François Velde saying the big problem is small change. So the problem is essentially if you have gold coins, it's, they're too valuable to pay little things. Okay, and that was a big problem. So it was not a gold itself was not an ideal way to do the role of medium of exchange either. So, in a sense, there is um, uh, you know for different forms of outside money like yap stones or gold are not the ideal form either. And this is a way we should see in the context of, of new cryptocurrencies and how this the things will play out. So essentially, we will always end up most likely with a two-tier financial system with fractional reserve uh, banking. And as was mentioned, the Vollgeld uh, Initiative in Switzerland, which will be voted upon on June 10th, is along this line to get rid of this fractional reserve banking. So you will have an anchor currency, this gold or the Yapstone, which will serve as a unit of account. And you will have some currency, which is essentially not a claim to anybody. But then you have deposits, which essentially is inside money on these anchor currencies. And that serves mostly as a medium of exchange. And then you have credit. And you have this triangle here, where the anchor is typically a very small supply, but then the credit is expanding. And the, the triangle is expanding, essentially, at the bottom, up and down. And you know the banking of this initial anchor could be commodity like gold. It could be less liquid credit claims. Or it could be just data. So it might be just some data control by certain IT firms. So let me go back to this uh, two-tier financial system and um, emphasize, this is from my work with Yuli Sanikov, essentially how such a, a fractional reserve banking system is prone to things we have seen and uh, Victor has experienced uh, during the crisis. So you have essentially banks which have some risky claims, let's say some credit and loans to, what, to one sector in particular, and uh, this sector is also holding some money, and the bank is issuing inside money. There will be some outside money, let's say in form of reserves, which is held by the banking sector. And let's see what happens if you have a negative shock to one sector in the economy for which the banking sector is very exposed to. So it could be some housing sector or whatever sector it is. And let's dissect the whole shock, the implications of the shock into four steps. So the first step essentially is that you know there will be some losses in the assets, but because the banks have exposure to this sector, the banks will suffer too. And of course, they can diversify across uh, these, uh, these sectors. So there will be some average of some uh, assets will lose more, others will lose less, and the banks diversify across this. But there will be an overall loss if it's a, a sector-wide shock or a macroeconomy-wide shock. The banks will suffer, and their net worth is going down. And if these risky claims go down by 5% because of leverage, the net worth will go down by much more than 5%, by 40%. And this way, after that loss, the banks will be way more levered than they are before. 
And what is the microprudent response to that? The microprudent response to this is to shrink a balance sheet. Okay, so that's what triggers the whole thing. If now, if you can just say, let's stop here, and you know the banks keep on doing and they diversify all these idiosyncratic risk from this sector away, things would be fine. But now they shrink the balance sheets and they delever. So essentially, they extend less credit to this, and this extending less credit means this sector has to shrink the balance sheet too, and they have to fire sell some of the assets. And this fire selling of these assets will actually lead to these liquidity spirals and depress the asset price even further, which lowers the asset value of this sector as well, lowers the risky claims, which hurts the banks again. So if there would be a one monopolistic bank, you wouldn't do that, but if they're competing banks, they don't internalize these fire cell externalities, and that's why it translates into more losses for the other banks. And that's where this paradox of prudence comes in. So if you think of every bank on its own is acting micro prudently, said, oh, after the shock, I was way more levered, I have to bring back my leverage ratio again. And that's actually a prudent thing to do, but by doing this, you affect all the asset prices, and that makes the whole thing you know, on the macro scale much more dangerous and much more risky because you lose them further on the assets on, of the sector, you lose risky claims value, and this actually brings the losses down uh, further. And that's essentially what is micro prudent, might not be macro prudent. It's the same thing as what Keynes said in the savings space if everybody starts to save at a higher rate, if I save more, then I spend less, and you have income is less, and hence, you know, the total uh, income is going down. At the end, we ultimately save in dollar terms, or in euro terms, we save less. So the interesting thing is also that when the banks still ever, not only on the asset side there's this fire sales going on, but they also create less inside money. Okay, when they create less inside money, total money supply shrinks. So the, the inside money, so outside money supply is still fixed, but the inside money is shrinking, so total money supply is shrinking, and that leads to disinflationary pressures and lower inflation, and that lowers, this increases the real value of this liability for the banks, which shrinks the net worth even further. So I might say, what's about money demand? What happens, money supply is shrinking, but money demand is actually expanding. Why? Because the banks that take out idiosyncratic risk in the economy and diversify it away, and if they are not active anymore, the idiosyncratic risk has to be held back by the households. And as the households have to hold more idiosyncratic risk, they shift away from physical investments into more money holding. So the portfolio choice, which let's say was 70-30 before, will now be 60-40. So they want to ask more money. So you have a shrinkage in money supply and expansion in money demand. And both forces essentially lead to lower inflation, okay? And to less activity in the real economy and so forth. And this essentially you would like to stop. That's where the central bank comes in. And essentially as the inside money shrinks, you expand the outside money and contrast that. And this might also be done through um, stabilizing the financial banking system. Now, let me go back to this. Essentially, you can think of uh, this triangle. You can think as inside money expands and shrinks and holding outside money fixed. You can think of the triangle essentially going together in a recession and an expansion expands uh, further. And that's essentially the way you can think this outside money and inside money kicking in. Now, in a world with a digital economy, with, we have to rethink money the way it is, but we essentially we don't have to rethink so much, we just go back to the foundations and there will be some new elements uh, to it. So what's the role of cash and reserves? What forms of money will emerge? You know, what should central banks endorse and fight? Should they fight digital money or central bank or digital currencies? Should they endorse cryptocurrency or the blockchain technology more generally? And how does it affect the competition among currencies? And that's essentially what I want to focus in. And then I talk at the end about tokenization. So that's based on the paper I've done with Joseph Abadi. So the first thing you might ask, you know, how does the old system was, we always had a centralized ledger, and it was controlled by some intermediaries that keep track of the banking accounts and all this. And the way you incentivize a bank from not lying and from not distorting the facts is through a franchise value. So you give them in dynamic incentives over time. So if they lie, they lose the franchise value, and then, you know, the value goes away. 
In a blockchain environment, you have many people who keep track of the same ledger, so it's distributed. So now, it's distributed, and you keep essentially you lose the centralized franchise value because there's free entry. So everybody can become a miner or a writer on a blockchain. And so you don't have this franchise value, so this dynamic incentivization is gone. You essentially need some static incentivization. So essentially you can classify uh, this in, in things. So if you have the traditional setting, you have one monopolist, let's say, and he has a franchise value, or a few players, he has a franchise value, you can incentivize this monopolist to do the right thing by giving him some franchise value, some carrots over time. He doesn't want to ruin his future in profits, so he will actually do the right thing. On the other hand, if you have a blockchain, you don't have the dynamic incentive because free entry, so you have many potential writers, and you need a different incentive scheme. And the way you can characterize blockchain, so the private existing system is very much centralized intermediaries who keep track of things on a, on a ledger or on a central record keeping device. And blockchains with the public blockchain are down there. Permission blockchains are in between. So as a permission blockchains are essentially settings like Ripple, where actually a few players have the right to write on this ledger, and not many of them. I mean, not, nobody can, there's no free entry, so in, in between. Okay, so the last thing I would like to emphasize is the, the fork. So once you have a blockchain, a blockchain is, consists of a chain of blocks, that's why it's called blockchain. Uh, so you have different blocks, and then at some point, the, some people might say, oh, this, that's what we want to write as the true history of transaction, of payments, or others might disagree and split in some uh, different framework. Or it might also be that in this blockchain we have implemented a certain monetary policy rule. So the monetary policy rule might say 5% inflation, and others say, no, we don't like this, we want to fork off or fork away from this uh, blockchain and go for 2% inflation. Okay? So you can have, uh, through this blockchain, you can have competition across different monetary policy rules where some fraction of um, miners or writers decide, okay, we go for a different rule. And then depends whether the users of this uh, cryptocurrency will come along to this new framework or not. So essentially there are two forms of competition. So one form of competition is this free entry that makes this blockchain, this public blockchain, uh, different. And as I mentioned before, the restricted entry leads to this permission blockchains. But the other difference in competition is this ability to fork. Okay? And what makes this ability to fork so different from existing competition? The ability to fork, once you fork, you carry all the information on the blockchain with you. Okay? So one, if let's suppose there's a currency out there, there, and I want to create a new currency, I don't know who is much in what wallet and all this. It's very hard to carry over to a new currency. But in a blockchain technology, I can just fork the whole blockchain, and all the information which was on the existing branch of the blockchain will carry over to the new branch. Okay, this makes competition way more fierce among these currencies. But let me put it differently. If you look at the old-fashioned Hayekian uh, currency competition, so there is cash, which you can think of uh, imaginary ledger, or each of you has some money in their wallets, and if I write everything down, I would have this imaginary ledger. And nobody really knows the distribution of this cash. Uh, of this cash. And if I want to propose a new currency, it will be very hard to coordinate over and bring to this new currency. On the other hand, if I have a cryptocurrency, I can propose a new fork, a new branch, branching away, and all the information which was an existing branch will be carried over to the new branch. So it's way easier to start up a new currency and say, okay, I propose a currency with a lower inflation rate or with a different monetary rule. And of course, I have to coordinate many people, which I have to do at the moment, right now, but uh, it's way more easy. Okay, so this reminds me of some analogy of 1922 in Greece, and uh, I see that uh, Yanis um, is here. Um, there was actually a forking going on in 1922 uh, when at some point, what's nice about the Greek uh, currency at that time is that you had get 
it was always written 500 here and 500 here, and there was a law where you can cut the money into two parts, and then you can use both parts. And one part you can convert was supposedly converted into a bond, and the other one was back in circulation. And essentially, this way it's like a fork competition because you don't need to know who has how much money, but all the information is actually kept, and I, I fork it nicely off. Okay. So let me jump over that. Let me just uh, uh, skip to the final point. Was that I, I talked about this inside money, but you can think of a system where essentially the unit of account and uh, the initial transaction among the banks is done on a cryptocurrency way. But what really happens on the private issues when people pay on the iPhone back and forth, these are just tokens from some IT companies. And that's what you see in China and in other Asian countries uh, evolving and coming up. So essentially, it will be less of the crypto side. So the crypto side will be much more the outside money side and will be the interbank market might do on a permission blockchain some crypto transactions. But the private transactions will happen much more on token basis because the banks or some people or some entities which are part of this interbank market Tencent, Alipaba, and so forth, they will issue tokens, and then people pay with these tokens, and this can be done at much higher frequency than compared to what the blockchain technology allows one. So let me conclude. So we have uh, macro models. I think we moved away from this impulse response function world to an endogenous volatility dynamics. Uh, the paradox of prudence, I think, is very important uh, here. And then we have various money models and because of financial frictions. And this leads, combined with idiosyncratic risk, leads to the endogenous demand for money. And that's essentially uh, can expand and shrink depending how the volatility moves around over the cycle. Money in the digital age, we will hear, I think, next and more in the next panel. The traditional way is to have a centralized monopolist ledger. The new way is to have these decentralized ledgers. But I think the interesting thing in terms of currency competition is this fork competition, where it, the competition can be much more powerful because it requires much less coordination compared to existing currency uh, competition. So it's way more powerful than a Hayekian uh, competition. And then we will have this tokenization by social media firms and payment firms like Tencent, Alipay, Amazon, and Apple, they are, it will be very similar to the free banking era in the 19th century in, in the US. Okay? The inside money will be the tokens, the outside money will be a cryptocurrency potentially, and, you know, and perhaps we need some digital money after all because machines will pay, have to pay each other rather than humans. So I stop with this futuristic thought. Thanks again. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm, I'm certainly very delighted uh, to, to be here honoring Vitor and uh, to me one of the titans that uh, essentially kept the Eurozone together. I see many of them here, but, but, uh, but you were certainly very central in all this. And as Mario mentioned, you certainly had to deal with many, many shocks. And I learned today that you did that while holding an enormous number of office hours uh, to, to my co-panelists here. No? So, so I admire you for that, uh, Peter. Uh, so let, uh, so uh, Marcus sent me three papers last Friday, all of them fascinating, uh, uh, as always with his work. Um, and I invite you to, I recommend that you actually read them. Um, I will focus on, on one of the topics. Uh, uh, the one that relates to what he calls, they call the I theory of money. I think it's a, it's a great framework to study the interaction between price stability and financial stability. It's a, just to remind you what it does, it's, it's a fr framework with incomplete markets. Households essentially have projects, uh, but they cannot sell uh, claims on these projects. Uh, intermediaries play the role of absorbing uh, the, the part of the idiosyncratic risk generated by the household's projects, and at the same time, they supply inside money, uh, which they use to provide. Uh, here is money in the Samuelson say, sense of a uh, store of value, no? but it's a way of diversifying your portfolio, making your portfolio a little safer, given that you're so invested, invested in these in this, uh, projects with idiosyncratic risk. Now, when the balance sheet of the intermediaries uh, uh, become impaired, then both functions 
essentially are heard. Uh, and that, I think, is, is the point that I like the most of all this work, uh, uh, work that Julian and Marcus have done, uh, which that produces an imbalance in the risk market. Uh, 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 essentially, uh, um, uh, agents need to demand more money because they now need to absorb too much risk of, uh, and they don't want to hold that risk. And that's what leads to this downward spiral that he described. Now, in that role, uh, monetary policy, then, when you look at monetary policy from that perspective, uh, uh, really what it's trying to do is to try to help, again, the agents to absorb the risk that the productive structure needs to uh, generate in order to function. Um, and, uh, and the, but what it highlights as well is that, well, if money is distracted in doing this, you know, in helping with the risk markets, then, then you are likely to generate moral hazard, and, and you need to have another tool to deal with that. So very naturally complementary, you have monetary policy and macroprudential policy sort of operating together uh, 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 when risk markets uh, are the focus of, of analysis. So I think this, again, I, I, I love every single paper that I've written together, uh, not only for the messages of the individual papers, but I think, again, uh, it aligns very well, at least, with something that I, I think is very core uh, for macroeconomics, and I think this, their work is, is very instrumental in, in shifting a bit macro into what I something I like to characterize as recentric macroeconomics. And let me summarize it with this very simple diagram. Uh, the way we normally think about macro models, uh, regular macro models, the ones we use uh, for everyday recessions and, and, and the ones we write in papers typically, is mostly about sort of the upper boxes there, no? Uh, a productive capacity, when it expands, capital generates output, and we need to find the demand for that output. No, and, and monetary policy is a lot about finding the demand, and fiscal policy about finding the demand for that output. But when output expands, when an economy grows, it also generates risks. There are new risks that arise. And we also need to find the demand for that risk. No? And, and lately, and, and, or when at least when we get significant financial events, actually the imbalance is much larger in the bottom panels than in the top panels. So the key game is how do we generate demand for the risk that the productive structure very naturally generates? And that obviously is what matters is not the risk is generated, but also the risk that is perceived by economic agents. So at times like this, you know, the red box that comes from the supply side looks enormous to economic agents, and the red box that is on the demand side looks very small. And we can think about monetary policy, conventional monetary policy as just increasing the appetite for that risk. You know, if you lower interest rate for any given expected return capital gains that you may have on, the, on, 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 on risky assets, then by lowering the interest rate, you increase the sharp ratio of risky assets, and that induces sort of a, a, an increase in, in, in demand for risk. Now, in a good, significant uh, financial event like the one you had to deal here with, that's not going to be enough. You know? That's, that you can expand a little bit that red box to the right, but it's never going to be enough to uh, absorb sort of all the risks that you have on the left. And if you're not able to do that, then asset prices collapse. That relates to what Roger was talking about. Asset prices collapse. That feeds into aggregate demand. And then that contaminates immediately the goods markets. No? And so you can think about QE policies, especially when they have a credit component and so on. It's really about adding appetite for risk somehow, either or it's about shrinking a little bit the supply of assets by absorbing that into the balance sheet of somebody that is not as, in, uh, uh, as sensitive to risk as, as uh, households and investors are. So I th see their work very much as moving us uh, in the direction of thinking about macro more in these terms. I've done some work, and, and uh, it's easier when you receive the papers very late to talk about your own work <laughs> uh, along these lines. In fact, I like so much this idea of recentric that that's in the title of the paper that Al Simsek and I wrote recently. And it's really a much more traditional macro model, but with this perspective. You know? So we call it a recentric model of aggregate demand recessions. And there, too, macroprudential policy will play a very important complementary, complementary role. And the basic idea is very simple. I have no idea how much time so you have, so I will tell you the story three times. Five minutes. In words and so on. Five but, okay, well, uh, so let me tell you once the story, and, and probably I will be able to tell it 
twice. So, uh, uh, so what happens here is occasionally risk rises dramatically, risk perception rises, risk premium rises. Uh, it could be because of problems in balance sheets intermediaries or something else. Uh, uh, and that, uh, if it is sufficiently high, then, then the central bank will try to uh, re 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 relax monetary policy, lower interest rate, but at some point it's not enough, we hit the zero lower bound, and that triggers a traditional recession. Now, one of the points of this work is that that feed, that is a feedback, in fact, and, and we were talking about causality with Royer, uh, uh, but real, look what happens is they feed into each other, because the risk premium no leads to a decline in interest rate, when that's not enough to balance the, the risk markets, then asset prices collapse, but when asset prices collapse, demand collapse, and so when demand collapse, the dividends collapse, or profits collapse, and therefore asset prices collapse, and there is a downward spir spiral that develops. And how, how deep that, that, that downward spiral is, well, the only thing that can balance that is some hope that you're going to get out of this situation, and then when asset prices decline, well, that gives you a big expected capital gain. But for that, you need to hope that you get out of the stuff very soon, because if not, there is no capital gain to be had. And so the degree of pessimism you have is very important in stabilizing an economy. And in that context, the speculation during the good time is particularly damaging. Okay? Because speculation by its very na na nature makes the economy extrapolative. In good times, the optimists may do very well. In bad times, the pessimists do very poorly. So to the extent that, that, that you have a speculation, you're going to have the wrong selection of individuals dominating the asset pricing at the time in which you fall into a deep crisis. And, and the anticipation of this even uh, uh, can produce even larger and larger effects. Okay? So the reason for macroprudential re regulation here is different from the one that Marcus highlighted, but, but it's, it's related. It's not a matter of moral hazard and so on, but it's a matter, it could be complemented by moral hazard. It's a matter of an aggregate demand externality. It's the fact that, that you will need optimists when things go wrong. You need people that can value highly uh, assets. Banks, because they can leverage and so on, are those type of agents. Okay, it's not about believing that the world will be better or not necessarily, but it's about agents that can value things highly, and you need some somebody that supports us as in markets when things go very wrong. Because of an aggregate demand externality, this is not a model of a pecuniary externality, it's a model in which there's an aggregate demand externality which you need to offset with, uh, you don't have monetary policy to dilute, that's what triggers the aggregate demand externality. Macroprudential regulation helps you because it protects the wealth of those agents that you need very much in a recession. Am I pointing at the right place or? Yeah. Oh, okay. So I have very little time clearly, but, but let me explain in equations, I think, what Roger was trying to say and, and, and John as well. Uh, so the model really is, is two equations. The first equation is, is really is the, is the goods market equilibrium. And uh, I, there's lots of shocks going around, everything is normalized. So all that I have there on the left-hand side is capacity utilization. And the right-hand side is consumption as a function of asset values, Q, and Q theory, investment as a function of Q. Uh, uh, and what you see from that equation is that it is the, that you need asset prices, you know, high asset prices in order to support aggregate demand so you can have full capacity utilization. But uh, that means that asset prices are really locked into this goal, into this role. You need an asset prices that are sufficiently high at Q star in order to have full employment. And the question then becomes, well, how do I ensure that I have enough wealth, price, house, house, house prices, stock markets, and so on? How do I ensure that I can support that wealth that the economy needs in order to have full employment? Well, for that, I need to look at the risk market condition. What is happening in the risk market, in the red boxes I had at the bottom? That's what the second equation does. On the left-hand side, you have the supply of risk that the economy has, the volatility of the economy, the perceived volatility. And on the right-hand side is a complicated way of writing the sharp ratios. What is a, it's a proxy for the demand for risk in the economy. So the issue is, well, suppose that the risk premium rises dramatically, the perception of, of volatility rises. Well, that immediately shifts the, am I pointing it? Well, anyways, it shifts the left-hand side up immediately, and it also shifts the right-hand side down, because for any expected return, given more risk, there is less demand for that risk. And so the role of monetary policy, as I said earlier on, is really to, I'm having a ball here with this stuff. 
there is a there is a lag talking about PLLs and so on. Uh, in any event, so uh, so interest rate policy will try to offset that, but if the if the jump in volatility is sufficiently high, it's not enough, and then asset prices will drop. But when asset prices drop there, in order to generate an excess return, no, I, I expected capital gain, but when that happens, that brings an aggregate demand and you get excess capacity. So here you had two scenarios, one in which there's a low risk premium environment, uh, in which uh, interest rates are positive, and that's enough to ensure the asset prices, the amount of wealth that you need to support full employment, uh, 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 interest rates are positive. Another one is a high risk premium state in which the interest rate becomes binding, and then asset prices collapse, that generates a recession, and so on. So the only one thing I want to say is that now pessimism matters a lot, both for good times and bad times. To be a pessimist in good times means that you think that it's very likely that you may go into this high volatility, high risk premium environment. And if that's the case, it's, it's easy to see in the formula, which is there at the bottom, at the top, that, that the equilibrium interest rate starts declining in the good state. Not necessarily because now you're afraid that when things go wrong, you're not going to have the interest rate to deal with that, asset prices will have to collapse, and therefore you have to, you need a lower interest rate to compensate for the expected capital gain that now takes place when you go into high uh, vol regime. I'm almost done. And then in the bad uh, uh, state, well, then pessimism matters a lot because, as I said before, when asset prices fall, if you keep dividends constant, asset prices fall, that immediately generates excess return and an increase in excess return. But if dividends come along, or expected profits come, come down because aggregate demand is coming down, then that doesn't, do, doesn't work. And in fact, in, in our model, what happens is the economy implodes. The more asset prices drop, the more profits demand drops, the more profits drop, the more asset prices drop, and there's no end to that. The economy implodes. The only thing that saves you is optimism. And what is optimism? Optimism is, is say, OK, look, this stuff is going to end in the near future. And if it's in the near future, then a sufficiently large drop in, the, in, in asset prices gives you an effort for capital gain that that stabilizes the economy. OK? Uh, I'm done. It's a good conclusion anyway. Huh? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm it's almost done. It's a fantastic conclusion anyway. No? That, yeah. I'm almost done. Optimism will save us. Well, you need enough optimism. That's an economy, you know, that, that they say you can see how as the economy becomes more and more pessimistic, the whole feedback sort of starts going worse and worse. Uh, and I'm not going to be able to say anything about speculation, but the blue line shows for the same level of wealth, of, uh, uh, distribution of, of, of level of wealth, for the same level of pessimism, collective pessimism, when you have more speculation, more heterogeneity in beliefs, the drop in asset prices, the feedback is more negative. And that's the reason you need to do macroprudential regulation here. Uh, and you do wonderful things with macroprudential policy. But in any event, so let me, let me conclude here. Uh, uh, so these are both views that I call recentric. They have differences, but they have something in common. And that's what I, what I want to finish with. Uh, it's a very recentric perspective of macro that highlights wealth effects. And I think everyone in the panel has done that. Uh, uh, and and it, it, the key question is, how does the economy absorb the risk being generated by the productive structure? And how to integrate monetary and, and, and macro prudential policies to make that absorption process smoother so it doesn't contaminate the real side of the economy. This is a variety of models now, new models, that really think about the world, about macro, in these terms. So let me end here. Thank you very much, Ricardo. So for the audience, there will be a quiz on Ricardo's model.